Well, good evening, boys and girls. Today I'd like to read for you a book called The Strange Birds of Flannery O'Connor. The Strange Birds of Flannery O'Connor by Amy Alznuar and Ping Zhu. Right from the start, young Flannery took a shine to chickens. As soon as she could hold a crayon, her floor was littered with drawings of roosters and hens. Your room, young lady, is a mess, said her mother. Hmm, said Flannery, her blue eyes flashing. I like it that way. Flannery especially liked the picture she made of a fat turkey squatting on the ground and a stick figure child sailing overhead. Her father carried it everywhere in his wallet. But it wasn't until 1930, when Flannery was five years old, that her passion for chickens really took off. She spent hours playing with her backyard birds. She even managed to train a bantam by glaring at it so long it backed away. A nosy neighbor alerted the press and the word spread until a New York cameraman heard the news and came all the way to Savannah, Georgia to get it on film. In that brief moment of fame, Flannery had a revelation. People didn't want to see any old chicken. They wanted a weird one. There was something about strangeness that made people sit and look up. After all, she felt like kind of an odd bird herself with her pigeon toes. At night, she had to do toe exercises to improve her posture. And during the day, she had to wear corrective shoes. Tarso Supernator Proper Built Shoes, she called them. Hold up your head, young lady, her mother told her on the way to St. Vincent's Grammar School for Girls. Hum, I heard someone once died of holding up her head, said Flannery. She imagined rocketing off the ground in her Tarso supernators, sailing above the world. Soon, she started collecting strange ducks and chickens, birds with one green eye and one orange, or with long spindly necks. Daggum, she thought. If only I could find one with three legs or three wings. She even sued her bird's little white piquet coats and lace collars. Best of all was a picture she found of a rooster that lived for a whole month without a head. Sometimes seated on her back steps, she wondered if she could do it, seize one by the neck and hack off its head. But instead, she began writing stories. Because it's in stories, you can make things as strange as you like. You can make people fly and headless chickens live. She wrote story after story and bound them into small books with pink or blue hardboard covers, uh, cardboard covers. Her father told her he might find a way to get them published. By fifth grade, Sister Consolata had had enough of Flannery's stories. I don't want to hear about another duck or chicken, she said. Hump, Flannery thought, and pulled back one of the rubber bands on her braces until it went zinging across the room. Whoa. Since no one appreciated her stories at school, 10-year-old Flannery started a club the Merryweather girls met in the shed behind her house. Chickens perched all around. From the old Portland bathtub, Lord Flannery, as she liked to be called, read her stories aloud. But when Lord Flannery was 13 years old, her family moved to Milledgeville and the club was disbanded.
Soon after their move, Flannery's father, her greatest fan, fell ill. He died only two years later. On a cold, gray day, Flannery knelt at the funeral, looking up at the altar. Death wakes a person up, she thought, like a wound in the side. She felt her heart filling up with grief, but even more with wonder. How strange to find something large and beautiful rushing in with all that sadness. After her father's death, Flannery returned to writing with a new ferocity. She wanted her stories to be as strange as death and to burn with sorrow and hope. But she needed things to write about, so she took to staring. She stared at everything, at tractors and fence posts and long dusty roads, but mostly at birds and people. Young lady, it's not polite to stare, said her mother. No writer should ever be ashamed of staring, said Flannery. Look at those big eyes. She's staring. If she studied something hard enough, Flannery found, she could always discover some hiddenness, some hidden strangeness, making it beautiful and funny and sad all at the same time. But what if other people couldn't see what she saw? She wanted to wake readers up like a rooster crowing and shock them into seeing. So she created large, startling characters, people filled with meanness and trouble and grief but also with flashes of good. And Flannery kept on, kept right on staring and writing, first at Georgia State College for Women, and then far away from home at Writer's Workshop in Iowa. She ached for Milledgeville and all she had left behind. So she rose early every morning and walked two blocks to St. Mary's for Mass. In the quiet, she could imagine she was home. And in the afternoons, she made her way slowly across campus through flocks of muddy, familiar geese, thinking out stories. But it wasn't just homesickness weighing her down. Her arms felt oddly tired and she had only enough energy to work in the mornings. So she wrote with fiery attention. Why do you work so obsessively? Asked one of her hallmates. I have to, that's all, said Flannery. When she read her stories aloud, her Georgia accent was so thick, people could hardly understand her. It sounds like climbing stairs, one person said. More like singing, said another. As she read, her voice took on every bizarre, tragic character she'd created and brought them to life. Sometimes the audience sat in sun stunned silence. Other times they laughed till they cried. After graduation, magazines and journals started publishing her stories. Soon a press in New York, where Flannery was now living, asked her to write a novel. But by now she could barely lift her arms to the typewriter. At age 25, Flannery was diagnosed with lupus, the same illness that took her father. So she said goodbye to her newfound world of writers and editors and returned home to Milledgeville, to her mother and her chickens and their 550 acre family farm. In the mornings, Flannery wrote, and in the afternoons, she practiced with her new silver crutches and read the paper. One day, an ad for peacocks caught her eye. The bird of the gods, she thought, and yet a cousin of the chicken. I'm going to order me those, Flannery said. Don't those things eat flowers, said her mother. They'll eat bird feed like the rest, said Flannery. A few weeks later, the railway express came chugging into the station. 
A shining blue head poking up through the crate like a trapped king. Oh, what do we see in there? I think I see a peacock. <laughs> Later, back at the farm, the peacock raised its tail. Flannery stared. At first, she saw only the back of it, the long knobby legs and tail feathers puffing out like underwear. But then it turned and a thousand haloed suns seemed to gaze down at her. Flannery didn't know if she should laugh or kneel. It was the strangest, most beautiful thing she'd ever seen. Like an unfurled map of the universe, she thought. Wow. Look at that peacock, holy. Beautiful. She ordered more and more birds until a peacock was screaming from every fence post and tree. She loved to stare at them, but even more, she loved to watch other people stare. One visitor slammed his truck to a violent stop. Others whistled or sucked in their breath. An old woman cried, Amen, Amen. Lots of peacocks all around. For the next 12 years, even though she was growing more and more tired, Flannery wrote letters to, to her countless fans, occasionally traveled giving lectures, and once even smuggled three baby ducks onto a plane. But mostly she led a quiet life. Each afternoon she moseyed about the farm on her silver crutches, softly calling to her birds, and every morning she sat at her typewriter thinking out stories as strange and dazzling as a tail full of suns. There's her silver crutches. In 1964, on a hot summer night, Flannery died with a priest standing by, leaving her mother, her birds, and her stories behind. Humph, you can almost hear her saying, death is far too strange a thing to be all that there is. Death is far too strange a thing to be all there is. And if you stare really hard, you can almost see her rising up and sailing above the world. Her silver crutches trailing out like wings and her blue eyes flashing. The brightest, oddest bird you ever did see. The end. Hope you enjoyed. Join me next time.